Hello, this is uh, Jeffrey Miller from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, my topic today is cephalometric analysis obsolete. When in, whenever we have a conversation about cone beam CT, it's natural to compare the cone beam CT analysis with a cephalometric analysis. And ultimately a question comes up, uh, which one is better, which one is more relevant for orthodontist? And Therefore, we have a topic. Is cephalometric analysis obsolete? My name is Jeffrey Miller. I graduated from Towson University, got my dental education at University of Maryland, my orthodontic certificate at State University of New York at Buffalo, my board certification in 1991. I've been in private practice for over 33 years. I'm a member of the Golden Circle of Excellence, and I speak on cone beam CT topics related to orthodontics. When you take a look at a cephalometric x-ray, uh, can you define the limitations of orthodontic tooth movement properly with a cephalometric x-ray? In other words, if you had to retract the incisors on this patient, how far can you go before dehissing the palatal bone? And then that's a question that uh, I believe is relevant or very relevant to orthodontics, which diagnostic tool is better able to provide that information. Here's another patient and these are very you know, good quality cephalometric x-rays. Uh, how far can these lower incisors be advanced before you perforate through the facial cortical plate? Obviously the lower incisor region is the most sensitive to orthodontic tooth movement because it's the smallest uh, housing. It's got the least amount of bone there and the thinnest cortical plate. When we talk about cephalometric x-rays, uh, this is an excellent quality cephalometric x-ray, but these teeth are fairly well aligned. But what if the teeth weren't aligned? In this case, where do you, uh, how do you determine where those lower incisors are and more importantly, where, how do you determine where those lower incisors fit into the housing and what is the limitation uh, to orthodontic tooth movement. Uh, cephalometric x-ray doesn't give us much, much information regarding lower cuspid expansion. You could take a posterior anterior view, but I find these very difficult to read and uh, of very limited value. When we talk about a cephalometric x-ray, part of the problem is the focal trough. We're taking an image uh, with a lot of superimposed structures. In other words, we have all the incisors overlapping each other. So it's impossible to tell what's going on on an individual tooth basis. With combing CT, you have ability to uh, vary the focal trough. This is the same scan, same patient. Here's with a 77 millimeter focal trough versus a 0.2 millimeter focal trough. This blue represents the thickness of the focal trough compared to much thinner focal trough that isolates uh, a single tooth and its bony support. In this case, it's a sagittal view. If this patient came to your office, would you hesitate to treat this patient if uh, it was just some very, very minor orthodontic tooth movement? Now, obviously, there's some problems here with, with uh, root resorption and a little bit of bone loss. But let's say you had something you could do in a month or two just to realign some minor rotations on the lower incisor. If you had the ability to slice through one single tooth, and eliminate all the superimposed structures so you could look at that tooth on an individual basis, this is what you would get. And I think that, that you could argue that that makes a difference in whether you would want to treat that patient. Whenever I show a slide like this, orthodontists are bound to say, well, that doesn't account for the, the bone that, would, that is surrounding the root of this tooth that's uh, burnt out or missing from the cone beam CT. Uh, and my answer is, so what? Uh, does that make a, a clinical significant difference? I don't believe it does. With cone beam CT, uh, you're looking at things from three planes of space. You have the axial view, the coronal view, and the sagittal view, as well as a 3D reconstruction. Patient's uh, amount of bone, or the the area that you can maneuver the tooth varies. It not only varies between patients, it varies uh, within the same patient at different segments of their arch. Here are three patients that need a retraction of the upper incisors. 
this patient on the far left uh, is not going to do as well as the patient on the far right. When you take a look at these uh, amount or the housings, uh, you can't really get an uh, indication of, of that using a pan and a cephalometric x-ray. With cone beam CT, each tooth, uh, the housing for each tooth can vary. And you can see here, uh, we have a little clefting of those lower incisors. Uh, from this information, you may want to consider surgically facilitated uh, orthodontic treatment where you put a little grafting material in there before you advance these incisors if that's the how you're going to treat that case. And these are things you commonly see when you use comb beam CT. So another case, a simple space closure case. But take a look at the clefting associated with, the, with that area of the upper incisors. The tooth is 5.8 millimeters and the bone in this bone between this area is only 4.3. So before you start closing that space, you probably will want to know uh, this information. There is no way you're going to get this information from a pan or a supplementary x-ray. It's the ability to visualize the uh, orthodontic walls or the limitations to orthodontic tooth movement that is uh, critically important for anyone moving teeth. It's critically important because if you move the tooth orthodontically through the cortical plate, you're going to develop bone dehiscence or fenestration. That doesn't mean that it's going to have an immediate result on the gingiva. It could take years for the tissue to strip, if at all. But as orthodontists, I think it's a, there's a good argument to say that, you know, whenever possible, attempt to keep the teeth within the bony housing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, uh, you can email me at drmiller at orthodonticassess.com. Thanks very much.